Welcome to the Spring 2013 Speech Night. I'm overwhelmed by your enthusiasm. I know that most of you walked in the doors going, oh, why is this a requirement? And I certainly promise that you will walk out going, hey, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> My name is Todd Guy, and I am a professor of speech here at Modesto Junior College, as well as the director of our speech and debate team. The speech and debate team is actually the oldest team in competition here at Modesto Junior College. They competed back in the 1920s. Back then, the only other teams that were competing were universities. And so they were competing against UC Berkeley and Stanford and whoever else was open back then, University of the Pacific. And almost in all of the debates, the Modesto Junior College students were beating the students from UC Berkeley. It got to be so bad that they asked the coach back then, the MJC coach was a gentleman by the name of Oscar Smith, and they said to Oscar, they said, you know, Oscar, really, you know, this is supposed to be competitive, but it's also supposed to be educational. So, so the Berkeley students were hoping that maybe we could, we could suspend the vote and not have votes for our debates. We could just talk about what we liked and disliked because they were so embarrassed consistently being beaten by Modesto Junior College students. Yeah. Uh, as the coach here at MJC, one of the things that I enjoy most about that story is also knowing that now in the present day, even though there are many more community colleges that compete in speech and debate, we still compete against the universities and the students here at Modesto Junior College still beat the students from UC Berkeley. And that's nice to know. The other thing that is really, I think, impressive for you to know with your speech and debate team here is that tonight you're going to be meeting some individuals who are state champions in what they do. And also, you'll be meeting a couple of national champions, people who are considered the best community college students in the events that they'll be presenting you this evening. Certainly, I can't do that and get the students to that height without some help. And so, even though I won't recognize them right now, physically, you will see them throughout the program. I have a couple of assistants that I'd like you to give a round of applause to. The first is Professor Charles Mullins, who gives his free time to coach the students on the speech and debate team. And then also Mr. Josh Ward, who comes in on his free time to coach as well. Also, I believe that uh, this evening we have a very distinguished dignitary here as well. I don't know if, if many of you know, but there is a board of trustees and the individuals that you vote in, onto this board of trustees are really the individuals that help keep Modesto Junior College and Columbia College, the community colleges that we need to be and the colleges for our community and these individuals do that and this evening we have one of those individuals here and so please give a big round of applause to Mr. Mike Riley. And now without any further ado let me introduce you to your spring 2013 speech and debate team here at Modesto Junior College. Beginning with Ms. Emily Akers, Ms. Carissa Autry, 
Mr. Seth Mitchell Bassett, Mr. Nick Brummel, Ms. Kelly Kearley, Ms. Melinda Dotson, Mr. Daniel Enos, Ms. Carrie Gendel, Mr. Jacob Holman, Ms. Shannon Martinez, Mr. Omar Mendoza, Mr. Ryan Reed, Mr. Michael Rorick, Mr. Wes Vieira, Mr. Aaron Wall, and Mr. Montana Webb, your spring 2013 speech and debate team. So this evening you'll be seeing five presentations of events that we do in competition, but most of all, the reason we're doing them this evening is for <coughs> all of you students who are required to come here from your Speech 100 and 102 classes, for the platform speeches that we'll be doing, possibly students from Speech 120 with oral interpretation of literature, and you'll be seeing a presentation of duo interpretation this evening. And then for those students in argumentation and introduction of debate, the final parliamentary debate that you may be doing in class or replicating some format in your argumentation class. This evening we'll start with our informative speech. And an informative speech is really a speech for the audience, a speech where the speaker is going to introduce you to a new, unique type of topic that possibly you don't know much about. And I think that our speaker will do that for you this evening. The speaker this evening that you'll be seeing is a speaker who came to the team in the spring semester last semester. Several of these students have done that. It's extremely difficult to join this team in the spring because really in the spring, the only tournaments we go to are championship tournaments. And so this individual joined the team last spring her first tournament was the Northern California Championships, and she took an award in the speech that she was doing, and so she was able to go along to the state championship tournament as well. So please give a big round of applause to Miss Shannon Martinez. He dresses in his always dusty clothes, and as he leaves the house, he grabs the hard hat he wears all day. The elevator marks the start of his shift, though instead of going up, it descends into the earth where he'll spend the rest of his day, never seeing the light of day. George Orwell once wrote, our civilization is founded on coal. In the Western world, the coal miner is second in importance only to the man who plows the soil. The earth holds precious minerals that our society relies on, but unlike our growing population, these minerals are limited. Thankfully, we don't have to despair, for we can mine these minerals from asteroids that are orbiting the earth. Yes, you heard me correctly. The idea to mine asteroids is not new, but the ability to do so is. Now, many of you may be wondering exactly what I first thought when I heard about this. What are you talking about? So. Let me clarify with something that might hit home a little more. According to the USGS website, updated daily, water covers 70% of the earth. Now, water is a key source of all living things, and we understand the importance of water. But with our rapidly growing population, our water source will not be able to sustain us forever. Thankfully, we can mine these minerals and water from asteroids that orbit the earth. So today we will dig into how asteroid mining will work, sift through the challenges, and unearth the benefits. So travel with me as we explore this new world. A man once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Albert Einstein understood that in order to further our knowledge, we mustn't restrain our imagination, for it's in our imagination that we create our future. The date, January 1st, 1801, the astronomer Giuseppe Piazzi looked to the sky and saw a strange object, something that was neither a comet nor a planet. However, it wasn't until the following year when the astronomer Herschel decided that the name Space Rock was unimaginative. 
So we set out to rename this new object, stretching the boundaries of the imagination. It was then that the term asteroid was coined, creating a new classification of space objects. 200 years later, the boundaries of the imagination have been stretched even farther with this mind-blowing idea of extracting raw minerals from the asteroids that orbit the Earth. Like all things built from scratch, however, research must be done in order to further understand the best possible way something can be accomplished. The well, same is true for asteroid mining. Ideas range anywhere from shaft mining, which is very similar to the type of mine that we do for coal, to self-replicating robots, an idea that's over three decades old, but in 2005, the very first self-replicating uh, robot was created. Rip Rap is its name, and after the robot has been initially built, it will rebuild itself using raw materials. Now this is a key concept in continuous asteroid mining. You see, by using this type of machine in space, it will cut the cost dramatically for the production of other space machinery. Not to mention lowering the cost of refining these minerals before sending them back to Earth to be used. Two gentlemen by the names of Eric Anderson and Peter Diamandis have taken the next step in this asteroid mining concept by creating Planetary Resources Incorporated, the first company to privatize this idea. Their mission, as stated on their website, planetaryresources.com, is to develop low-cost robotic spacecrafts that can explore the thousands of resource-rich asteroids within our reach and determine those rich in minerals. The company has the backing of a few billionaires, such as filmmaker James Cameron and the CEO and executive chairman of Google. With this sort of financial backing, the company is currently building robotic telescopes that are small enough to fit in the palm of your hand and weigh nearly nothing, with the idea that they will be able to analyze these asteroids and find those that we can use. But because this concept is still very new, however, let's dig into some of the mine shafts and unearth the flaws to these ideas. Carl Sagan once said, the fact that some geniuses were laughed at does not imply that all who are laughed at are geniuses. So while many physicists, scientists, and astronomers, or those that we attribute to as being geniuses, think asteroid mining is the new frontier, there are still some very big disadvantages. Let's start with the first concept I mentioned earlier about how this mining can happen, the shaft mining method. As I stated, it is very similar to the type of mining we do for coal. According to thinkquest.org, shaft mining is the type of mine that you generally see in movies, where the miner travels deep down in an underground tunnel until he, or she, reaches the bottom, where the ore is then taken to the surface to be refined. Now, this is very dangerous, even on Earth, where we have far more control over the environment. You see, asteroids do not have gravity, their conditions are not as predictable, and it is uncertain how an asteroid would react to parts of it being extracted. Now, according to the article, How Asteroid Mining uh, Will Work, by Kevin Bonzer, it is speculated that of the asteroids that are in the asteroid belt, it could exceed somewhere around $100 billion for each of the over 7 billion people on Earth. Now this is a tremendous amount of money, but again, it is just speculation. So because this concept is still very new, let's drill into some of the mine shafts and find what is keeping these inventors and dreamers going dead set on space mining. When one Googles the age of Earth, in bold numbers it reads at the top, 4.54 billion years with a circumference of 24,901 miles. The rock we live on is the fifth largest in our solar system, and according to the United States Census Bureau on January 1st, 2013, the population was 7,056,700,180, with it increasing by over 200,000 people a day. We will outgrow this rock we live on, and that is why many are looking for alternatives off this planet. Though it is expensive and challenging as most new ideas generally are, there are still some very strong advantages. Now, according to the Space Review's online article, uh, The Cost of U.S. Piloted Programs, it costs nearly $1.4 billion to take a single uh, flight into space. Now, by mining asteroids that are rich in water, 
this cost would drop drastically, thus allowing for more frequent flights. You, you see, water can be broken down and used as rocket fuel. It can also be used as oxygen and, of course, stay hydrated. Now, all of this has to be taken up with the shuttles for each flight. By having it already in orbit, however, it will cut the cost dramatically, thus allowing for more flights. Now, our planet has given us everything we need to survive, water, food, and oxygen. And by mining asteroids that are rich in these minerals that we use in our daily lives and technologies, it would allow us to save lives because it would, it would keep those uh, that would be mining out of harm's way. Now, with, with asteroids so dense in minerals that a single platinum-rich asteroid could yield more than the yearly output here on Earth, gives companies like, like this high expectations that money will be lost, but gained. Although this idea sounds like it would never happen in our lifetime, it already is. The Japanese have successfully brought back particles from an asteroid 200 million miles away in 2010. The mission of the Hayabusa lander was aimed directly at a specific asteroid since its launch in 2003. Now, since its return, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, has been analyzing the asteroid's particles to better understand the composition of these asteroids. Now, this is the first step in asteroid mining, but a tremendous leap in space exploration. Today, we dug into how asteroid mining work by sifting through the nuggets of the positive aspects of asteroid mining, and we also saw some of the landslides asteroid mining. Those concepts seem far-reaching, like Sarah Van Brevenich, author of Simple Abundance, once said, the world needs dreamers, and the world needs doers, but above all, the world needs dreamers who do. Hello, my name is Charles Mullins. I'm one of the full-time faculty here at Modesto Junior College in the Speech Communication Department. It's also my great pleasure to be working with the Modesto Junior College Speech and Debate Team this year. Uh, the two performers I'm about to introduce to you are, some of the t are two of the most talented people we've, we've had on the team. Uh, the first one is Aaron Wall. Aaron Wall, when he joined the team last year, started winning awards immediately, which is always a pleasure. So he's, he's basically turned everything he's touched into gold or into trophies. So we're very we're very happy to have him. He's not only competed in most of the interpretation events, he's also competed in the prompt too. And so it's really been a nice addition to our team. His partner is Carrie Gendel. Carrie Gendel, there are divisions uh, of, of experience in the event. And uh, there's beginner or novice, and there's the more advanced people in the open. Carrie never competed in novice. She started to write at the open level there, and she started winning awards right away at the open level, not only at the state level, where she earned two silver second place awards, she's also earned at the national tournament third place in prose interpretation and second place in impromptu speaking. So the event that they will be performing for you tonight is called Duo Interpretation. It's a little bit different. Uh, it's like an acting event. Uh, in many ways that they're still developing characters, but it's not like an acting event. We call it interpretation because they'll be holding their scripts. Not that they're reading their scripts aloud to us because they're still performing the characters, but it just allows the audience to realize that yes, this is from a piece of literature. And, uh, and they won't be necessarily looking at each other. They'll be performing what we call an offstage focus. Because in interpretation events, we don't have things like set pieces and things like that, or costumes. They'll be wearing nice suits, and there won't be any set pieces or anything out there. So everything that they're going to do is going to be visualizing out in the audience, which takes the audience into your head rather than looking at what's on, what's on stage, or rather what isn't. But you'll notice the event as they're doing it. So I'm, ple I'm very pleased to, to introduce to you Aaron Wall and Carrie Gendel. Excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry to bother you. Uh, 
Is this chair taken? Oh, excuse me? Is this chair taken? Oh, yes it is. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bother you. I'm really sure sorry. Thing. Excuse me. Is this chair taken? No, but I'm expecting somebody very shortly. Would you mind if I sit here till he or she or it comes? Well, they, they do seem to be pretty late. You never know who you might be <laughs> turning down. Yeah, sorry. Nice try, though. Sure thing. Entrepreneur Jim Rohn once said, if you're not willing to risk the unusual, you'll have to settle for the ordinary. Hmm, hmm. profound. My mom always told me you gotta kiss a lot of frogs before you find a prince. I guess either way you say it, when it comes to communication, especially in romantic situations, one runs the risk of crippling rejection, lack of chemistry, or even complete disconnection. But if we remain steadfast in our hope that we can create long-lasting connections with another human being, we will eventually find that meaningful communication is not only possible, but also well worth the risk. Betty and Bill, two strangers who meet in a coffee shop, explore the inevitable incongruities we all face in communication. In Sure, sure thing, thing, by, by David, David Ives. Would you mind if I sit here? No, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Every place else seems to be taken. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> What's the book? You know, I, I just kind of wanted to read quiet, if you don't mind. Oh, no, 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 sure thing. Every place else seems to be taken. Mm -hmm. Great place for reading. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> What's the book? Uh, the Sound and the Fury. Oh, Hemingway. What's the book? The Sound and the Fury. Oh, Faulkner. Oh. Have you read it? Uh, yeah, I read it in college. Oh, where was college? I was lying. I never really went to college. I just liked to party. Woo! Where's college? Harvard. Oh. <laughs> Do you like Faulkner? I love Faulkner. I spent a whole winter reading him once. Yeah, I, I just started. I was so excited after 10 pages that I went out and bought everything else he'd ever wrote. One of the best reading experiences of my life. All that incredible psychological understanding, page after page of gorgeous prose, his profound grasp of the mystery of time and human existence, <sighs> the smells of the earth. What do you think about it? I think it's pretty boring. What's the book? The Sound of the Fury. Oh, Faulkner. Do you like Faulkner? I love Faulkner. He's incredible. I can't believe I waited this long to read him. Oh, uh, you might not have been ready for him. You have to get these things at the right moment, or it's no good. It's all in the timing. My name is Bill, by the way. And Betty. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I, I, I thought reading Faulkner was a, uh, a great experience. Yep. <laughs> the sound and the fury. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Well, uh, onwards and upwards. <laughs> <clears throat> Waiter, it's all in the timing. My name's Bill, by the way. I'm Betty. Hi. Hi. So, um, do you come here a lot? Why are you asking? Oh, I'm just interested. Yeah, maybe you're only interested for the sake of making small talk long enough to ask me back to your place to listen to some music. Or because you've just rented this great DVD, or because you've got this terrific unknown Barry White album. All, all you really want to do is it. Which you won't do very well. After which, you go to the bathroom and pee very loudly, and then you'll proceed to go to the refrigerator and get yourself a beer without asking me whether I like anything. And then you'll proceed to lie back down beside me and confess you've got a girlfriend named Stephanie who's away at medical school in Belgium for a year, and that you've been involved with her off and on, which is called a very intricate relationship for the past seven years. None of which interests me, mister! <sighs> okay. Do you come here a lot? Every other day, I think. Oh, that's interesting. I come here quite often. I remember seeing you here. Yes, you must be on different schedules. Missed connections. Yes, different time zones. Oh, amazing how you can live right next door to somebody in this town and psh, not even know it. No. City life. It's crazy. Well, the waiters here sure seem to be on some different time zone. I, I can't seem to locate one. Waiter! Waiter! So, what do you do? Oh, oh I beg you. Sorry. Me. Amazing how you can live right next door to somebody in this town and not even know it. I know. City life. It's crazy. You weren't waiting for somebody when I came in, were you? Actually, I kind of was. Oh, uh, boyfriend? Sort of. What's a sort of boyfriend? My husband. Ah, you were waiting for somebody when I came in, were you? <laughs> yeah, actually, I kind of was. Oh, boyfriend? 
Sort of. What's his sort of boyfriend? My lover. Here she comes now! Uh, Stephanie, over here! You were waiting for somebody when I came in, were you? No, just reading. Sort of a sad occupation for a Friday night, isn't it? Reading here all by yourself? Yeah, I, I guess it is in a way. I mean, what's a good-looking woman like yourself doing out here all alone on a Friday night? No offense, but... I'm out alone on a Friday night for the first time in a very long time. Oh. You see, I, I just recently ended a relationship. Oh. A rather long-standing. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, listen, since reading here by yourself on a Friday night is such a sad occupation, would you like to go elsewhere? Uh, no. Do something else? No, no thanks. I was heading out to the movies in a little while you know, anyway. I, I don't think so. Oh, come on. Big chance to let Faulkner catch his breath. All those big sentences get him pretty tired. No, thanks. Thanks anyway. Well, okay. I, I, I appreciate the invitation. Sure thing. I, do you come now? Yeah, every other day, I think. Oh, that's interesting. You were waiting for somebody when I came in, were you? No, just reading. Oh, sort of a sad occupation for a Friday night, isn't it? Well, reading here all by yourself? Well, I guess I was just trying to think of it as existentially romantic. You know, cappuccino, great literature, rainy night. Oh, that only works in Paris. <laughs> we could hop a late plane to Paris, find a cafe. Well, I'm a little short on plane fare tonight. Darn it, so am I. To tell you the truth, I was going to head to the movies after I finished this section. Would you, would you like to come along? Oh, well, that's a really nice offer, but unfortunately uh -huh. I... Uh-huh. Girlfriend? Two, actually. One of them is pregnant with Stephanie. <laughs> girlfriend? No, I don't have a girlfriend. Not if you mean that castrating bitch I dumped last night! Girlfriend? <laughs> no, <laughs> sort of, sort of. Uh, what's a sort of girlfriend? <laughs> My mother. <laughs> I just ended a relationship, actually. Oh. Of uh, rather long standing. I'm sorry to hear it. To tell you the truth, I, it's the first night I've been out alone in a long time, and I feel a little bit out at sea. So you didn't stop to talk to me because you're a Scientologist or because you've got some weird political affiliation? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Straight down the ticket Republican. Straight down the ticket Democrat. Can I tell you something about politics? I like to think of myself as a citizen of the universe. I'm unaffiliated. That's a relief, so am I. Yeah. <laughs> I vote my beliefs. You know, labels are not important. Labels are not important. Exactly. I mean, take me, for example. What does it matter if I only had a 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 in college? <laughs> sure. I believe that a man is what he is. A person is what he is. A person is what they are. I think so, too. So what if I admire Trotsky? So what if I once had a total body liposuction? So what if I didn't have a penis? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So what if I once spent a year in the Peace Corps? I was acting on my convictions. Sure. You just can't hang a sign on a person. Listen, I was headed to the movies after I finished this section. Would you like to come along? Sure. That sounds like fun. What's fun? A couple of really early Woody Allen movies. Oh. Wait, you, you don't like Woody Allen? Oh, no, no, no. I, I like Woody Allen. But you're, you're not crazy about Woody Allen. Well, those early ones, they, they kind of get on my nerves. Uh-huh. I was headed to... Oh, oh I, I'm sorry. No, no. I, Go ahead. <laughs> I, I was going to say I was headed out to the movies in a little while, if you were... So was I. The Woody Allen Festival? Just up the street. Do you like the early ones? I think anybody who doesn't ought to be run off the planet. <laughs> how, how many times have you seen bananas? Eight times. <gasps> Twelve. <gasps> so, so are you still interested? Do you like Eneman's crumb cake? Yesterday, I went out at 2 o'clock in the morning just to get one. Did you have an Etch-a-Sketch as a child? Yes. And, and you like Brussels sprouts? Well, I think they're disgusting. They are disgusting. They totally are. And, and do you believe in marriage in spite of current sentiments against it? Yes. And children? Three of them? Two girls and a boy? On their way to Harvard, Vassar, and Brown. And will you love me?
Yes. And cherish me forever? Yes. <laughs> so, do you still want to see the movies? Sure thing. Waiter. The next event that you will see will be a persuasive speech. And for those students in speech 100, 102, that will be one of the required major speeches that you need to get through to help you transfer to that CSU. A persuasive speech is basically a speech where the speaker is trying to convince you to take a specific type of mindset or belief. Or a persuasive speech is put together to try and get the audience to take action against some type of injustice that's happening in our society. The speaker that you will see tonight, right now, is ranked number two in Northern California, going into our Northern California Championships. He's been with the speech and debate team here at Modesto Junior College for two and a half years. This is his very last speech night performances, and he is this, at this moment on the team from last semester, he is the most award-winning student on the team thus far this year. And so please give a big round of applause to Mr. Nicholas Brummel. drives to an interview at a nearby pharmacy. She is desperate, as her unemployment benefits have exhausted, and she doesn't know how she will manage to survive. She takes a moment to collect herself before meeting her potential employer. <sighs> the interview goes well, and she's offered $11 an hour. All that remains is the mandatory background check, which shouldn't be a problem, as she has no criminal record. Two weeks later, she receives a call from the pharmacy, telling her that the company, regretfully, cannot hire her at this time. Her world is shattered. Without an income, she loses her apartment and is forced to live in her car. After some investigation, she found that the background check had mistaken her for another Kathleen Casey, who lived nearby, but was nine years younger. After pointing this out to the pharmacy, they respond that, well, the position has already been filled. Kathleen then falls into depression, unable to eat or sleep, or that this mistake could happen again, leaving her without an income or even a home for the rest of her life. As reported by Press Telegram News, December 12, 2011, Kathleen's story gives us an alarming insight into the disastrous consequences of faulty background checks. Each day, people are struggling for a career and facing endless obstacles. And just when that dream job is moments from their grasp, victory is torn from their hands. One small, incriminating error may mean the difference between a means to support yourself and your loved ones, and yet another rejection. And not one of us is safe. From instantcheckmate.com, one of the leading providers of digital background checks, I found that I could be mistaken as one of 14 other Nicholas Brummels, each of whom holds criminal records. With that example in mind, we must first look into why this issue is running rampant. Then. Look at the problems being caused by faulty and illegally applied background checks, so that finally I can offer some solutions to this growing problem. No longer can we just sit back and allow others to take what is rightfully ours. We all know of the tentative state of our economy. However, it is most affecting those who are seeking a career. From single mothers struggling to provide for their families, to students desperate for means to fund their future, each rejection means a new struggle a new despair. Time states on August 8, 2012, that this is a particularly painful economy, which is only feebly recovering, leaving few positions ready to hire. For this reason, that pool of employment opportunity is depressingly shallow. The article goes on to state, 
that those most adversely affected by background checks are those who hold criminal records. See, in the American society, we have always taught that we should learn from our mistakes and use them to better ourselves. However, the message these record holders is receiving is that there is no redemption, <coughs> at least within the career market. Research Nation found on August 15, 2012, that background checks have victimized countless individuals who are simply trying to better themselves. One such victim posted on the website HireSafe.com that since receiving his charge due to his possession of marijuana, he had been unable to find a position anywhere. He stated that this one mistake had left him in constant fear that any attempt at a career is doomed for failure. He since has had to take medication to counter depression and even suicidal tendencies. So, between the decreased amount of employment opportunity and the readiness of employers to disregard anyone they find undesirable, background checks have become the final step which can either make or break your entire future. And sadly, between the massive amounts of mistakes made by these companies to the illegal ways in which employers are applying them, background checks have gone from a helpful innovation to a devastating injustice. So, with our flawed economy, we need to focus on the problems which are leaving many good Americans, such as Kathleen Casey, on the streets. The Huffington Post, April 6, 2012, identified faulty and illegally applied background checks as the greatest obstacle faced by the unemployed, citing the hundreds of thousands of known incidences to date. Some of the incidences reported were mistaking the applicant for a criminal of a similar name, reporting arrests as convictions, and even reporting crimes which the applicant never committed and was never even charged for. And not only do these mistakes happen, but they happen at an alarming rate. The US Public Interest Group found that since 2004, 79% of background checks contain at least one error. And even beyond this, background checks have been shown to fuel discrimination. AOL Jobs reports on February 19, 2012, that a disproportionate amount of minorities, particularly African Americans, have been affected by background checks. They state that this is due to the employer using these as an excuse to prefer the white candidate. These inherent faults have become such a problem that legislators have decided to respond. Since 2002, several provisions have been added to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which enhances security measures taken to protect people from background checks. Some of these provisions included that no crime exceeding seven years should be reported, that only conviction, not arrest records, may be shown, and that applicants must receive an identical copy of any background check given to a private employer so that mistakes may be identified. Now, with these laws in place, how is it possible that background checks continue to ruin lives and spell good, qualified candidates like Kathleen Casey to the street? The answer is quite simple. Employers are shirking their responsibility to applicants and disobeying federal law. The Huffington Post article previously cited explains that 85% of employers do not even read all reports and will only pull the files of perfectly clean applicants. This leaves anyone who has a record or anyone who was mistaken to have a record, to have little to no chance at becoming employed. These injustices need to stop, and solutions must be put in place so that we can diminish the harms we are seeing in our society. Cornell Law published an article August 13, 2012, stating that the main thing preventing justice for victims of background checks is that they are unaware of their rights as applicants. Therefore, by equipping ourselves and our loved ones with knowledge of not only our rights, but what to do when those rights are neglected, we are providing ourselves and our loved ones a greater means of attaining security. The Fair Credit Reporting Act gives several important rights, all which can be seen under FTC.gov. However, Yale Law emphasizes that certain rights must be kept in mind during any interview. These include the right to know what is in your file, the right to receive an identical copy as any given to a private employer, the right to dispute, and most importantly, the right to seek action against those who break this promise. The, website, the law website defense perspective explains how this is done through a few simple steps. First, you have to demand the background check. Second, of course, dispute. Third, 
check the courts to make sure that your record is completely accurate. And finally, once you have proof that there was a mistake, pursue legal action to redeem payment for damages from the violators. A legal advisor will know best who made the critical error, whether the background check company or the employer, and get you what you rightfully deserve. Also, AOL Jobs reported July 18, 2012, that legislators are ready to take action against the illegal ways in which background checks are being applied. Therefore, now is the time to go to your legislators and demand that they install legislation that forces employers to not only inform applicants that they use background checks, but to also inform them of their rights as well, and offer penalty against those companies which refuse. This is the only way that employers will be held responsible for their impractical hiring methods. Today, we looked at the conditions which have caused this problem. Then, we looked at the criminalization, discrimination, and overall injustice that is resulting from invalid background checks. Before finally, I offered some solutions to this growing problem. In our current economy, too many Catholic cases have been thrown aside for a crime they didn't commit. When it's time for your new beginning, do not let yourself fall victim to the same fate. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Ward. I'm the other assistant coach of the MDC debate team. And tonight I get to introduce you to Mr. Ryan Reed. Ryan is one of our top competitors. He holds state and other awards for his extemporaneous parliamentary and impromptu debate styles, or uh, impromptu speaking styles. Uh, his top award to date was last year when he took a second place in extemporary, uh, third place, sorry, in extemporaneous speaking at our state level. Uh, today, or tonight rather, Ryan is going to be engaging in my favorite type of speech, which is that of impromptu. And this is especially fun here at Speech Night because we get to involve you guys. We, we've had assertions in the past that perhaps we're not being you know, true to the spirit of using a very small amount of time to prep for a five minute speech. And in order to cure any doubt you might have, we get the ideas from you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get three different things from you. Ryan is going to pick one. He's going to take two minutes to prepare a five-minute speech and deliver this wonderful, meaning, deep, and moving speech. Uh, if he doesn't, feel free to boom off the stage. That's fine. So the first thing I want to get from the audience is a famous person. And please stay away from pop culture. That is so boring. Anybody? Shout it out. Obama! Really? Okay, I was very enthusiastic for Obama. Oh, oh, we, we got Obama, we got Obama. Get, get another chance. Next, I need a song title. This should go pop culture, obviously. <laughs> Speech team does not get input in it. Well, can't touch this. Or who, or, or who let the dogs out? I'll let you pick. Woof, woof, woof. Call me, maybe? Okay, who let the dogs out of this? And finally, I need an object. Something weird, not that kind of weird. Just weird. Binders full of women. No, we're not doing Romney's binder. Okay, what the hell? We'll do Romney's binder full of women. Full thing, though. Not binders full of women. Romney's binder full of women. Romney's binder full of women. All right, that being said, Ryan's going to prepare for two minutes. Please try to keep it to a dull roar as he will be concentrating, and then he's going to impress you and awe you with his rhetorical skills.
past week, my fellow teammates, coaches, and colleagues on the speech and debate team have been there to help me and listen to me while I've had a relatively rough week adjusting to new classes and through other trials and tribulations. And it's this closeness and this idea of community that I thought of over the past week that reminded me of tonight's prompt of Call Me Maybe. And I agree with this because to me, what it means is that community is an important part of all of our lives. And we'll look at this through a few different points of analysis. First, we'll look at it through the historical figure, Joshua Norton. Second, we'll look at it through noted educational reformer, Salman Khan. And then finally, we'll go ahead and wander the world a bit with noted author, Samuel Clemens. So let's go ahead and turn a page in history with Joshua Norton. Now, Joshua, Nor Joshua Norton may not exactly be the most recognizable name, but he immigrated to America in the 1860s. And he was very wealthy when he first started out, but through a series of bad investments, he lost all of his wealth. So like anybody else, he decided to reinvent himself. And he decided to declare himself Emperor of America. And along the way, he gave a couple of decrees, such as abolishing Congress, although today that may not be such a bad thing given their popularity ratings. But throughout his time, it, he grew and grew and became a cultural figure. The people of San Francisco loved him because of his eccentricities. And when, when the police force of San Francisco decided to try and involuntarily commit Mr. Norton into the Insane Asylum, the people of San Francisco rallied around him and they came to his aid. So much so that the police forces released Mr. Norton and they actually issued a formal apology. And from then on, whenever the police forces passed Mr. Norton, they would salute him on the street. And in the end, when Mr. Norton died, what ended up happening is 30,000 San Franciscans turned out for his, uh, for his burial. And it was only through that idea of community and bringing people together around him that Mr. Norton was able to achieve this. So we can see how that ties directly back in to my interpretation today. So, now that we've turned a page in history with Joshua Norton, let's go ahead and learn a little bit of something with Salman Khan. Now, Salman Khan is a noted educational reformer because of his different idea of going about education. You see, what he did was he decided to post 10-minute short YouTube videos on subjects ranging everything from biology to economics to physics and everything in between. At some points, certain people doubted him, saying that you know, YouTube is only really for videos of funny cats and that sort of thing, but Khan pressed on. And now he's noted for it, his ideas on the Khan Academy website, where he's given millions and millions of lessons, not only to students here in the United States, but also to students all around the world. And he's helped contribute to the world community and helped draw an entire web community around him. And it's because of this idea of bringing people together directly back in with my interpretation today. So now that we've looked and learned a little bit of something with Salman Khan, let's go ahead and read a book with Samuel Clemens. Now, Samuel Clemens is more commonly known, of course, as Mark Twain, but Mark Twain started down, of course. He started out as a steamboat captain, and then he started, went to becoming a journalist, and then he actually ended up writing a couple of witty articles and catching the attention of certain people, and he was in, ended up being able to write his books, Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, and was gained much notoriety and fame. But again, like my previous story, he made a series of bad investments to his publishing house and lost all of his money, and lost all of his wealth. But what ended up happening was Mr. Clemens had to go around the world with a series of lectures and engage the world in, in his wit and his wisdom. But he was able to gather the entire world around him much like he was able to capture the imagination and spirit of America in his novels. And because of this, he was able to draw forth an entire literary and American and world community. And it's this idea that ties directly back to my interpretation today. So today, what we've looked at is we've turned a page in history with Joshua Norton, we've learned a little bit of something with Salman Khan, and finally, we read a book with Samuel Clemens. And of course, all of these tie back with my interpretation today, of that community is an important thing, and why I agree with the quotation of song title, Call Me Maybe. So if we're lucky, hopefully as we go out into the world tonight with our friends, family, and colleagues, we're able to find community, much like I've been able to find community amongst my friends and loved ones on the video team.
And now we come to our final event of the evening, the parliamentary debate. Parliamentary debate has a huge history, and really a huge history here at Modesto Junior College. Parliamentary debate is based off of the British Parliament from way, way back. And when the British Parliament would get together, the, there would be the government side, and there would be the opposition side. And in Britain, they're very loud and boisterous. And if you ever went to a British Parliament, you would see that the audience participates in the debates there. So this evening, we want you to feel free to participate as well. And so when you hear arguments that you like, then feel free to stomp your feet or pound on your arm rest there, or say, hear, hear, and just say, hear, hear, when you hear those arguments that you like. But the other history with British Parliament has to deal with how it came to become a competition because really parliamentary debate as a competition is only about 20 to 30 years old here in the United States. And it really came to California because of the, my predecessor, Professor Charles Ewing who went overseas and saw competition in parliamentary debate being done from universities in Britain and Ireland and Scotland and even Africa and Russia. And he came back and he said, you know, this is a fantastic idea to make a debate where the students have no idea what they're going to do 20 minutes before they actually do the debate. And we'll tell them the topic, they'll have 20 minutes, and then they're just gonna debate. It'll be great, it'll be fantastic. It is now the largest type of debate that happens in competition. And for California, it really is due to my predecessor, Professor Charles Ewing. The four debaters that you see up here today are award-winning debaters from several tournaments. On the affirmative side, we have Nick Brummel, but also you see Ryan Reed up here, who will be replacing Mr. Daniel Enos this evening for this debate. And on the opposition side for this debate, you see Emily Akers, a novice debater who, who has won enough awards in the fall semester that she will now be competing against the university people this spring and representing the school well at our Northern California Forensics Championship. And hopefully repeating this year is her partner, Wes Vieira. And hopefully what he'll be repeating is that right now, he is your community college national champion. And so for this final debate, the resolution that they have is gun control reform is more important than mental health reform in the United States. Enjoy. Our, uh, our last crowd was kind of dead. So if you guys could show some, uh, some responses to these arguments, that'd be great. So if I were to say that, say, you know, I know, the education budget in California should be doubled, I would get what kind of response? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay, so you guys are awake, that's good. The House will now call the Prime Minister, Mr. Ryan Reed, to the podium for a speech not to exceed four minutes. All right, to go ahead and start out, I would like to put forth some thank yous. Thank everybody for being here Thanks so much. Uh, also the opposition and my partner, of course. So to start this debate out, we're gonna go ahead and start with some resolutional analysis. So we're just gonna go ahead and reread the resolution. It's gun control reform is more important than mental health reform in the United States. So just to define and make things a little bit more clear, we're gonna go ahead and define gun control reform as ensuring that guns are not in the hands of those that society deems unfit. 
The second key definition that we're going to go ahead and put forth here is that mental health reform is focusing on identifying individuals who have mental health issues and giving them proper treatment. So since this is a value debate and it's a direct comparison between two things, two value-based decisions, we're going to go ahead and put forth the criteria today and all that means is what you guys are going to vote on, which is just whichever side supports the, the round's value the best. And we're going to go ahead and put forth the value of maintaining safety. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get down to the arguments. The the first contention, the first argument that we're going to put forth is that we solve for gun violence better. Now, violent crime involving guns is not performed by individuals with psychological issues. Now, 87% of gun violence incidents, including armed robbery, armed assault, murder, etc., were confirmed not to have noticeable psychological dilemmas or issues, according to the New York Times. Now, this clearly shows that identifying psychological issues uh, and psychological problems can only remove about 13% of gun violence. However, 73% of armed criminals have criminal records. This is according to, again, the New York Times on December 18, 2012. I'll go ahead and get to you at the bottom of the points there. So therefore, any reform that's put forth could only ensure that these criminals do not have access to guns, which our definitions provide, and can eliminate up to 73% of armed crime. This comes essentially down to a numbers game. 73% of armed violence can be eliminated with gun control reform, and only 13% can be eliminated with mental health reform. Your point, sir. Yes, are you aware that people who have performed felonies can no longer own firearms in the United States? Yes. Okay. So, the second argument and second contention that we're bringing forth is that we'll, we will ultimately improve the political climate by doing anything with gun control reform coming first. Now, gun laws have been polarizing legislators from both political parties back and forth, and these laws have been used to negotiate and used as negotiating tools in order to pass other, otherwise polarized legislation. This is according to Politico. Essentially, what we're saying here is that this really doesn't really lead to any sort of discussion, compromise, anything like that. Long story short, what we're saying is Congress isn't really getting anything done, but that's not news to anybody. So this, what this ultimately leads to is lackluster policymaking. Essentially, they're not doing anything useful and they're not doing anything well. So once this reform is successfully employed in the gun control reform that we're advocating, legislators can actually, hopefully, focus on discussion and compromise and getting all sorts of things done like doubling the education budget of California. So, <laughs> mental health reform, however, has been largely a non-issue in any, any sort of legislative discussion, and even less in federal lawmaking. So, therefore, appropriate gun control reform will immediately improve congressional decision making. So, for all of these reasons, you're going to be signing in the permanent ballot tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. The House will now call the leader of the opposition, Mr. West Vieira, to the podium for a speech not to exceed four minutes, Wes. Four. Not four Go ten. Go the four o'clock and just keep going. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming out. We as the negative team are here to show you that mental health is just as important as gun control reform or more important. So the first thing we're going to say is that we're going to concede on the first observation of the fact is the definitions and the criteria, yes, this is a value. And we are going to show how we better perceive the, mainta um, the maintaining of safety through mental illness reform. So let's go down to our first kind of contention. The first one is the fact that mental health reform will reduce not only gun violence, but violence overall. The view point of this is going to be the warrants. The first warrant is according to crimeinamerica.net, nearly one in five violent offenders in prison were identified as mentally ill. That's 20% of all violent crimes that happen in America are perpetrated by people who are deemed mentally ill. And we're not just talking about gun violence, but overall violence here in America. These people were identified mentally ill in prison. This is just simply too late to figure out these individuals were disturbed is after they commit the crime instead of before they commit the crime. And the second word is that according to the Washington Post, Arizona has been ranked as 49th in the country in psychiatric bed availability. If they were able to identify and house this pe these people, then Jared Lochner could have received help. It would have prevented him from shooting the congresswoman Gabby Gifford. 
The third contention is that Connecticut is one of the six states that does not have provisions for assisted outpatient treatment, which could have stopped the Sandy Hook shooting if we were to identify that he was mentally ill before he decided that he wanted to kill innocent children at a school. The deep point is that is going to be the filter. If we had more effective identification treatment, then we could actually identify the mentally ill and help treat them so they no longer have to predicate upon the population and we no longer have to be victims of these violent crimes. Yes. Okay, my question is, um, how do you believe these people will be identified? What kind of plan would you implement? This is a value case. This isn't a plan. I don't have to implement a plan. I just have to say that mental health is more important than gun control because we're saying that in a whole, we're not trying to argue solvency. For our second kind of condition, they pointed out that is going to be the thesis. It's reform the gun control doesn't work, reform the mental health does. The viewpoint is going to be the wards. The first one is according to the John Hopkins Center for Gun and Policy Research, the majority of gun-related homicides are from age 15 to 23. According to the statistics, majority of the guns were illegally obtained. Hmm, sounds about right. The second warn is that only 1% of guns used in violent crimes are actually traced back to gun dealers, meaning that it was actually 1% of all guns in violent crimes were legal guns. They were already illegally bought or obtained. So putting in laws don't work. The deep point is going to be that of the filter, that gun laws do not work. Mental health shows, oh, yeah, mental health shows a positive effects which near the people. They will, receive, they will seek and receive treatment, which means that they are no longer being harmful to themselves or to the population abroad. Now let's look at their contentions. Now the first contention is the fact that we saw. Why don't you cross apply our second counter contention, the fact that just because you put a law in effect does not mean you solve it. We have a law against murder. That still happens now, doesn't it? Now, let's look at the fact that they say that 87% of the people who commit crimes are actually sane. That's great, but we're going to say that we're going to stop not only 13% of gun-related violence because these insane people get help and are taken off the street and no longer have access to these guns, but also we're going to say that we're also going to help solve for 20% of all violent crimes in America because we've stated that in our first contention that 20% of all violent crimes are from the mentally ill. So their, counter, their first contention is just basically, we're going to wish upon a star and it's going to happen. Yeah. Let's look at the second counter contention, this political environment. My first response to this is, are you joking? You say gun control or gun reform and Republicans go insane. Republicans first off say that they're going to actually oppose anything Democrats say. Thank you, Mr. Lady, for finishing on time. The House would now like to recognize the member of the government, Mr. Nick Brummel, for a constructive speech not to exceed four minutes. All right. Um, so thank you again, everybody, for being here. You're helping the team. We appreciate it a lot. So I'm just going to jump right into this. So I'd like to remind everybody of our definition really quick. Gun, tr gun control is ensuring that guns are not in the hands of those society deems mm. unfit. Basically, what that means is that all the people who aren't criminals mm. can have all the guns you want. We're encouraging it. So you can. Slow so we're encouraging that people can have protection. Clear. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I speak really fast. Okay. So as I was saying. <laughs> Everyone who wants guns and who isn't a criminal can have them. All we're saying by our gun control reform is that we're ensuring that guns are not in the hands of those society deems unfit. Basically, all we're advocating here is that there are harsher regulations and inspections against criminals. Is that something that we're trying not to advocate for? So what we're saying here is that we're not just saying, no, there has to be gun control. We're saying that a plan needs to be put in action which regulates specifically criminals significantly more. So I'd like to just make that clarification right away before I get into the argument. All right, so going on to the arguments, they're saying that one in five violent crimes um, that they would be solving for by looking at mental health. All right, violent crimes do not usually lead to death. However, according to Politico, out of the death, cr the crimes that led to death, guns led to a vast majority, lead being at 8,000 as opposed to the closest, which was nice, at 1,900. That means there's a 6,000 death margin that happens as a direct result from guns, as opposed to any other violence. So yes, they might be solving for more violence than we are. However, we're saving more lives. So ultimately, you're going to be looking at that when you make your decision, because we're saving more lives, even if they're solving for more crime. Now, what I have to advocate is exactly what they're looking for here. So basically, they're saying that some type of thing that makes people have more access to 
mental health research. I'm sorry, but they have to provide something more specific here because A, that would either mean more intrusion, which means they have to make sure that everyone is psychoanalyzed to ensure that they're not crazy. I'm not sure if you guys want the government to have that much control over our minds, literally, to where they can come in and psychoanalyze every single one of us to ensure that we're not crazy, but that's not something I want. I believe that the government needs to have certain restrictions. Restrictions. So in that way, they need to advocate for something more specific. And if they're not advocating for intrusion, then what are they advocating for? People to say, okay, um, let's encourage people to feel free about their mental abilities. And so we're going to try encouraging people to go seek help. Honestly, guys, okay, first of all, even if Obama's health care plan does provide for mental health care, there's still a copay. And I'm a college student, and a $50 copay is enough to scare me off from treatment. That is for sure, because I just do not have money to go spending on copays to make sure that I'm not crazy when I understand my own mental state. So in that way, we can all see that they are not advocating anything that actually solves. They're saying gun control reform doesn't solve. At least we have a plan to look at. What are they trying to do? Nothing. They don't specify. They don't specify how this could possibly happen. We don't have wands. We can't cast spells. This isn't Harry Potter. We can't just make people want to get mental health care. All right, so moving on. They provide an example of Sandy Hook. They provide an example of Sandy Hook, which I find hilarious because you know what? His mom had health care, perfect health care. She could have had him. Your time is up. It's close. As I was saying, Sandy Hook, they're advocating that, okay, maybe if we had better health care, we could have prevented Sandy Hook. Okay, that guy was insane. And you know what? His mom had perfect health care, and she could have taken him to get mentally checked. But she didn't. And that's exactly why their plan sucks. Because as you can't force people, you can't force people to go look for help. You can't force them to pay the $50 copay. You can't force them to do anything. If you're just raising a PR idea saying, no, go get yourself checked, nobody's going to do it. And you know what? Crazy people aren't known for making good decisions, guys. They're not gonna go get themselves checked. It's not something they'll want to do. And I'm sorry, but I know my mental state enough to not advocate for someone to be coming in and psychoanalyzing me. So again, we're solving for all the violence that leads to death, even if they're solving for a fifth of total violence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nick. Just to clarify, I'm pretty sure he's not saying Sandy Hook was hilarious, despite how it came out. Uh, we'd now like to welcome the member of the opposition, Ms. Emily Akers, to the podium for a constructive speech, the last one, not to exceed four minutes. All right, so I'm gonna start off case first with our counter contentions. The first one is that mental health reform will reduce not only gun violence, but violent crime overall. We gave you three fabulous warrants on this um, about you know several shootings that have recently happened. Um, the only ink that they put on the flow when they come up here is saying that we're only solving for the 20%, which first of all is a huge number. Then they come up and act like violent crimes doesn't matter. Um, just because they weren't shooting people, there's still rape, there's still assault. These are still crimes that are happening. And it's 20%, that's a huge number. 20% that we can prevent at the end of the point, Nick. That's 20% that we can prevent by promoting and making mental health care more accessible to these people who need it. And he comes up and says that this is intrusive of the government. Um, you want to talk about government intrusion, um, taking away guns from law-abiding citizens? Please. Point of information, how yes, law-abiding citizens are part of this. We said specifically that law-abiding citizens would have their guns. You're talking about government intrusion. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, the law only affects innocent people who follow the laws, Nick. <laughs> anyway, on to our second contention, um, which is gun control reform doesn't work, and mental health reform does. We gave you words on how gun control doesn't work, and how even if we did implement more restrictions on guns, it's not going to do anything because 1% of the guns used in violent crimes were not tracked back to dealers. There's nothing you can do about these guns in the system. And, by, and it goes back to the whole intrusion thing, trying to get them would be intrusive. Um, and we showed you, we gave you a great warrant from the New York Times, is that how mental health works. In, um, in New York, Michael, point Michael point York from New York, at the end of the point, Nick, um, over the past five years, he has passed legislation to improve the condition of mental health care in New York. Over the past years, New York has risen from nothing to number one in the nation for mental health care. So we can tie this back to the, val both of these back to the value of uh, promoting safety and ensuring safety. 
Um, we're helping people get the help they need, mental health care that they need, and we're um, preventing them from uh, making these uh, violent crimes. Like we said, 20% of all violent crimes, that's not just shootings, that, that's rape, assault, um, all those violent crimes which could be prevented through better mental health care. Let's go on to their counter conditions. The first one was um, solving better for gun violence. Like my partner said, you can cross-apply the analysis from our second contention. These guns are illegally obtained. Just because you put a law against something doesn't mean it gets it off the street. I mean, I'm pretty sure we have a law against marijuana and cocaine. Pretty sure those are still on the street. There's nothing you can do about it. So um, you can't really look to that contention at all. So on to the second one, an improved political climate. They say that gun laws are polarizing political parties and it leads to lackluster policy making and that they need to focus on other issues. Um, I'm pretty sure this will polarize them even, fa even farther. Um, the Republicans would deadlock it and they'd get tied up in the courts for so long it'd be a huge waste of time that we could be spending on other issues. So that other contention is not gonna stand up. So when you look at our value today of promoting safety, you're gonna look at um, both of our counter contentions and show that that does that way better. We all wanna save America, you know? <laughs> right? And by looking at our contentions and how um, if you get those people the help they need and stop 20% of the crime, you're definitely gonna have to fill out a negative ballot today. Are you gonna take my question? Oh yeah. <laughs> Could you remind us how you're gonna force that 20% to get help here? We're making it more accessible and when things are more accessible, people seek it. All right, that ends the constructive phase of our speeches. We now welcome back to the podium the Leader of Opposition, West Sierra, for a rebuttal speech not to exceed two minutes with no new arguments. So this is gonna be why you're gonna be filling out a ballot for the negative team. One question, who likes guns? Honestly, awesome, that's what I'm talking about. Who watches American Horror Story? Yeah, 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 that's what I figured. That's what happens though. So when we're gonna look here, we're gonna look at our off case. Look, the bottom line is the fact that we are reducing violent crimes by 20%, not just gun violence. Nick is talking about 30,000 people, 8,000 people. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people every day that are becoming victims to these violent crimes, these assaults, these robberies, these rapes. Yes, they are trying to save lives, but not only are we saving lives, but we are saving people from being raped, for being so fearful that they cannot move out of their own homes, for fear that they will be killed, they will be beaten, or they will somehow become a victim of a violent crime. We're taking away 20% of that. So we're giving you as a public some peace of mind saying that these people will be taken off the streets, these people will receive the care that they need, and we will reduce your risk by 20%, where they're saying that we're just going to reduce gun-related violence by a mystical 73%. Now let's move on to when they say government intrusion, saying that I want to just, excellent point that Emily brings up. We're talking about taking away guns. The government coming in and saying that you cannot have the right to own these guns because people who break the law do bad things. That's like saying, that person got in a car accident, now everyone can't drive a car. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. And when we look to the fact that most of the guns that are related to these crimes are in fact illegal, it's the fact that we already have a law that bans them and yet they are still being used to murder people. When we talk about more restrictions, it makes no sense. Laws only affect people who follow the law, not the criminals. And when we look to the fact that Mental health care reform does work. I want to point out when you look to New York, they are number one in the country for health care. Not because of anything, but the fact that we put in reforms into legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. We now finish back with Mr. Ryan Reed, the Prime Minister, for the final rebuttal speech, not to exceed two minutes with no new arguments. All right, so I'm going to start out this speech with the exact same question that he had before. How many of y'all like guns? All right, how many of y'all are law-abiding citizens? Yeah. All right, you can keep your guns. I'm glad we're okay with this. So, we're not taking away guns from anybody, okay? We're calling for gun control reform. We're saying that people who society deems unfit should not have guns, okay? You all are law-abiding citizens, mentally healthy, mentally stable in school, so keep your guns. So, we're going to go ahead and start this out with an overview. 
Overall, this is a numbers game. It's a numbers game that they end up losing because if you look back to the previously agreed upon value, it's the idea of maintaining safety. And they agree. And we show how we're able to maintain safety through gun control reform. Now, they bring up all sorts of ideas of how you know, there are still all sorts of illegal substances and illegal things out on the street. Essentially, what they're advocating there for is nihilism because they're saying we shouldn't make laws for things we can't restrict. We need to take at least some kind of action, and we think that this will at least solve better, or at least has a better chance of solving, So, or at least has a better propensity to do so. So you can look back to my partner's previous analysis that this isn't exactly Harry Potter, folks. OK, we can't just wa magically wish things away, and crazy people don't make the best decisions, such as not seeking, or not seeking mental health care. So that means we have to make some kind of laws, take some kind of action, or at least do something and prefer something in order to try and change the status quo. So, and that's exactly what we're advocating for. So when we look at the number of crimes and we look at the fact that we're able to solve for a significant number of crimes, we look at my partner's analysis for the $6,000 number deficit there, you can see that we're able to, to solve and we have a better propensity of solving a lot better. So in terms of things happening and the way in which they happen, mental health care is a nice long-term solvency, but in the end, for a solution that works right now, you're going to want to go with gun control reform. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now welcome back to the podium Mr. Todd Guy, who will explain to you how you can cast your vote for tonight's round. At the end of every debate and competition, there has to be a vote. And since you are the House, Tonight, you are the individuals who get to decide who wins and who loses. And so, could I have a round of applause for all of those of you who would vote for the affirmative? And now, could I have a round of applause for all of those who would vote for the negative? Normally now I say, well, it sounds like a tie, but I guess I can't say that this year, so the negative wins it. Have a good evening, and please drive safely. Thank you for coming.